Um, so it is my great pleasure to welcome Jess Day, who is digital strategist and client manager for More Onion. And Jess is going to talk to us about how to boost your impact through integration. So over to you, Jess. Thank you, Dila. Can everyone hear me okay? Can I get a thumbs up? We can, yes. Excellent. So good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining me here. I'm going to be talking about how to boost your impact through integration. Um, Firstly, to introduce myself, I'm Jess Day. I work for More Onion. We're a digital mobilization agency with staff and clients across the UK and mainland Europe. We work uh, exclusively with progressive nonprofits on their campaigns and fundraising through strategy, consultancy, digital development, design, training, um, and our mobilization platform, Impact Stack, which lets you easily and quickly build optimized web forms, including campaigning actions and fundraising pages. So here's a selection of the charities we work with. Yes, I can't see your slides. Oh, you my slides, uh, slide okay. share has not worked. I'm so sorry, that's such a bad start. <laughs> no, it's fine. This is what we're here for. Don't, don't you worry at all. Now we can see your slides. Now we Yay. can see the slides. Okay, <laughs> so let me, <laughs> let me apologize for galloping in too quickly. I'll just give you that. Uh, you haven't missed anything important, but I'll just give you that slide with a list of uh, um, some of the clients that we work with. So today I'm going to be talking about integration. So I'm going to start by defining terms. What do we mean by integration? It can be a bit of a buzzword. Everybody thinks it's a good thing, but what does it mean in practice? So by integration this morning, I mean acting as one organization, prioritizing your supporters' needs over your internal divides, speaking with one voice in order to build better relationships with your supporters and offering them a range of ways to engage with your organization and your cause. So I'm talking primarily about public audiences here, so donors, community fundraisers, campaigners, but obviously can extend also to volunteers, staff, service users, beneficiaries. Obviously, in many places, people will fall into more than one category. So this sounds great, but what does it mean for what we actually do? So in practice, it means the joint planning and collaborative working, the management of your data and the connection of different technical systems to make those coherent and integrated system experiences possible. So what I'll be talking about today are just the kind of activities that are going to need all that change management and staff supporting thinking that Kate and Beth have brought us this morning. So it's, it's really great to see how uh, what we're talking about this morning all fits together. So why integrate? Um, why does it matter? And why do we need to do it? Integration benefits everyone, both us as people campaigning and fundraising on behalf of a cause and our supporters. Good experiences and regular contact from an organization means more activity, more donations, more campaign activity, more volunteering, and that means more impact. If you look at it the other way around, you can't afford not to. If you had a friend who kept sending you invitations to their party after you'd already said yes, or they failed to invite you in the first place, or asked you to chip in for another friend's birthday present when you'd already done it, you'd pretty soon reassess that friendship. So we really mustn't do that to our supporters. Putting it another way, recruitment is hard and expensive. <laughs> Much better to keep our supporters active and retain their goodwill. So let's look at a few examples. Um, Freedom from Torture. We work with them on a supporter journey project and we found that people emailing their MP or taking another engagement action were four times more likely to become a regular donor and four to five times more likely to make a cash donation. The Trussell Trust have seen a doubling of the level of the activity on their campaigning actions, which they put down to a more integrated approach across a range of audience to promoting their actions. And in a pilot email, welcome journey we worked on with versus arthritis. New supporters who took a non-financial action were 4.6 times more likely to give a cash donation. So the examples with data attached to this are often financial because that's easy to measure, but across the board, engagement begets engagement and activity begets activity. So to illustrate what we're talking about here, let's start with a dream scenario. Meet Jane. So Jane clicks on a Facebook um, link and signs a petition from Creature Protectors to save the sloth. And she opts in to hear more about the organization. Her data and her opt-in flow automatically into their database and mailing software, ready to send an automated welcome series of emails to introduce her to the organization's breadth of work. However, She's already opted into communications from Creature Protectors. So instead of getting their automated welcome series, the next email she re receives is a request to make a donation, which refers first to the sloth's petition and tells them more about this specific issue. 
she arrives on a landing page, which pre-fills with her name, and she makes a donation of £500. This means that instead of the standard follow-up email, she gets direct follow-up from the fundraising team and she's not sent standard email appeals in the future. It turns out that Jane's MP is on a key committee discussing an issue that's relevant to swath protection. And because she gave her postcode on the petition form, creature protectors are able to email her and others in regular relevant constituencies to ask them to contact their MP directly and explain how they have a specific opportunity to help swaths. And she does so using an action form that records that she's taken the action. A few weeks later, she gets a follow-up asking whether she's had any reply from her MP and asking her to share the response. Jane responds via a form, which prefills her name and the MP's details to say that yes, she actually went to meet her MP in person about the topic because she was so inspired by finding out that her MP had a particularly powerful role here. And it turns out that this MP has a personal connection with the issue, which creature protectors didn't already know about. She also gives her phone number and permission to contact her via telephone. So the next thing she gets is a call to ask her to consider making a regular gift. And the phone script includes a reference to her campaigning activity. So seen from Jane's perspective, this all looks pretty straightforward. An organisation that gets in touch and knows what she's doing for them. But an enormous amount of organisational cooperation and data processing needs to happen to make this possible. Who feels confident their organisation could deliver something like this right now? And think about perhaps a, a locally relevant fundraiser instead if you don't campaign. If, if you're shaking your head, don't worry, not many organisations are in a position to do this and certainly not consistently. It's super hard. But supporters' expectations are shaped by interacting with organisations like well, Amazon or Netflix, communications that don't seem to know, from an organisation who don't seem to know who you are or what you're already doing for them will really jar. So I'd like you all to have a little bit of a reflect on what your integration challenges are at the moment. Um, and so we're gonna have a little poll so we can all see what situation that we're in. So if you've got a smartphone to hand, you can use the QR code to access the menti.com website, or you can go to the address and enter the code here. There's also a direct link that you can take, uh, go there on another browser window. So I think Lauren's gonna pop that into the chat and uh, respond to the little poll there on what stands in the way of integration in your organisation. If, if the answer for you isn't there, don't worry, we're going to have an open question next. So if you maybe don't have a database or an old database that's not fit for purpose, multiple databases which do certain things well but don't talk to one another, um, a new database which hasn't yet been well configured to meet your needs, choosing a new, a new database is hard and, and investing the time in setting it up properly is also hard. Um, data process, which processes which are slow to move data around from one system to another. So days delay between somebody opting in and being able to follow up by email with them. And then the more process oriented things. Do you have team silos with different objectives and no mechanism for cross team planning? Is there resistance to change? So that picks up on some of the topics we talked about earlier this morning. Changing something that works, even if it works really well, or even if it doesn't work very well, can make people really nervous. Um, are you collecting separate opt-ins, meaning you can only send certain things to certain parts of your email list? So I'm just going to um, take my slides down and we can have a look at the results. Can I just get a quick thumbs up and check everybody can see the results now? We can see the results. Excellent. So we're getting lots of responses. Really interesting here. So organisational silos is the most common one. So actually the biggest barrier, and again, this talks really strongly to the, the other presentations this morning, the biggest barrier often is not the technology, <laughs> um, though obviously technology is still is still there. So we've got lots of people with separate consents, multiple databases, not very many with no database at all. I guess that's good news. Manual processes, a few people with new databases that are not well set up yet, but in general, um, you know, are, are quite a widespread. So if you're if you're thinking, oh dear, we're struggling with this, you are in very good company. Don't worry. So let me see if I can move on to the next question. So second question is what integration challenges do you face? So if there was something that you're thinking, well, actually my biggest challenge is not on this list. Now is your chance to plop it down and share it with the group. You should start to appear automatically once you hit submit. So I'll give you a moment to do your thumb typing. Creativity. <laughs> Yeah, 
cost, time, 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 time. There's a lot of time on here. Capacity, time. Yeah. Database doesn't connect to anything else. Time. Time. Time's the big one here. How do I get the space and time? And I think there's a real thing here about everybody feels like I have to just plow on with doing things the way that I can, because even though it might be a slow process, I know how to do it and I know when I can deliver. And that really you need to be given quite a lot of headspace to be able to step back and work out how to resolve these challenges. Skills, time. Skills, time, capacity. Thanks for sharing those, everyone. Right, I'm going to pop my slides back up and I will share those slides at the end so people can go back and take another look. So give me a sec to just reshare. Brilliant, Jess. And while you do that, can you just move your microphone up a little closer to your mouth? Am I a little just, quiet? No, no, it's just catching your scarf oh. every now and again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's all right, no worries. We can see your slides again, Jess. Okay, cool. Let me just get my screen set back up. Okay, so if you're feeling a little bit doom ridden at this point, don't worry, um, you can at least feel that you are in good company with a with a big integration challenge. The aim today is for me to show you a few ways that some of our clients have tackled some of these challenges and demonstrate you don't have to deal with all of them at once. So while many of the examples I'm going to talk about are using our fundraising and campaigning platform impact stack by no means all of them are. Um, the, and the idea, these ideas are very transferable. They're not technology specific. And the examples use different combinations of technology. They're working at different scales. So we hope there's something here for everybody. So first principle, good integration is everybody's responsibility. It is not just up to the data team. And that's coming through very strongly today. If you're a comms person, you might feel like, oh, data, I can't do anything until this database project they've been talking about for the last five years finally arrives in the sunlit uplands of, of data happiness. Um, and I can't do anything until then. And I'm going to throw up my hands and leave it to the data people. Do not do this. Whether you're working with an internal data team or directly with external suppliers, those data experts need you to make strategic decisions about what you need the system to do, and you need to be fully engaged in that process. Start with strategy. A fantastic tech stack is not going to deliver integrated supporter experiences if your organisation doesn't have um, processes that plan them and if your uh, strategy hasn't influenced how your tech stack is configured. Be prepared to put in plenty of work on the strategy and the people side to make sure that any technical system is going to deliver what you actually want and that you're actually planning integrated communications to be delivered through this um, new technology. And crucially, don't panic. You don't have to do it all at once. So let's look at some places to start. So having said it's not just about the tech, the tech matters. Connected technology makes connected supporter experiences possible. Think back to Jane, information about her activities needed to pass into the organization's database and into the email tool in order to allow that tailored messaging to go with go to her with, with relevant actions that were really tailored to her um, actions and experience. A CRM or customer relationship management system acts as a central repository for your contact data. So you can have this 360 degree view of your supporters that gets talked about a lot. Even a good CRM will only be useful if it's properly configured with a deep understanding of your business needs and connected with the other systems that you're used, you're using. See above about strategy, what I've just said. So if you don't yet have a data set, you need database, you need a new one, or you need to invest in upgrading or adding new integrations to your existing database, you'll need to make a business case for, for why to make that investment. So hopefully some examples today are going to help with that. And remember that business benefits can include automating manual processes and freeing up staff time to do other work or to improve errors and uh, reduce errors or um, improve data security, as well as improved supporter retention, better communications, raise more money, generate more actions. You'll need to start by mapping out what data you have, how it's currently flowing from one system to another and which flows you might need to change or introduce to achieve your goals. So when we work with missing people to help them plan a new welcome journey for new supporters, we started by building up this map with them to clarify where data was collected, stored and transferred. Ideally, information needs to flow between your web forms where you collect data via actions, event registrations, donations, whatever method you're collecting data from people to your email marketing system and your database as quickly as possible. In practice, you might be more likely to have a flow that looks like this. 
with data export files being manually processed and loaded into different systems from wherever you're collecting data. This can be rather time consuming um, and it may be less secure. Web forms which integrate directly with your email tools remove this manual processing. So opt-ins and personal data can pass straight into the email tool. This means fewer errors, less staff time spent on it, and crucially, quicker and more tailored follow-up for your supporters. Obviously, another solution is for data to flow automatically between your web forms, your CRM, and your email tool. So in this example, uh, Trussell Trust have a full integration from Impact Stack, so that data is synced automatically into their Salesforce database in near real time, meaning that they can um, allow prompt follow-up via email and greater analysis and segmentation based on supporter activity and behavior. So their goal is to ensure that they can see whether individuals are engaging only with specific issues. For example, they only take actions on particular topics or only with particular kinds of actions. For example, then maybe somebody never responds to requests to contact their MP. And that means they'd be able to ask particular people to do a type of action they're more comfortable with on a new issue, building beneficial and deeper relationships with their supporters. Some of our other clients take support action and donation data from Impact Stack via webhooks. That's a technology solution which provides the transactional data securely in a standard format, ready to be processed. So in one case, um, it used to take one to three weeks to get data into one organization's CRM um, and then onwards into their email tool, which meant prompt tailored follow up was very difficult. Data is now going to flow through this new process in near real time. Whatever tech you're using, wherever you collect data and content to contact is going to need a process. So it's really important that all your technology choices take data integration into account. If you don't have a CRM, there are still things you can do. We don't recommend it. <laughs> um, work out your minimum requirements, work out what you really need to do and focus how you can meet them for now. And also ideally think about it in terms of how can I build a business case for a better and more robust solution longer term. And of course, always be mindful of handling data securely and compliantly. But here's an example. Um, International Tibet Network are a really small organization with a small staff and a small budget, but they deliver tailored supported email and landing pages experience through a combination of Impact Stack and MailChimp. So supporters who take a campaign action are offered different thank you pages based on previous activity. So if they're a member of one of their groups or they've recently donated, they're asked to share the action and they're not asked for money. If they've donated before, but not recently, they get one of three different donation asks depending on the value of their previous donation. And this is all done by based on tags and data passed automatically between Impact Stack and MailChimp. So here's how it would look at the end of the action. You get a pop-up and the, the figures that you're prompted here will depend on the, the value of the previous donation that you've made. Crucially, the additional data fields and data flows were worked out based on their strategically decided requirements. So they have an audience which includes donors, which represents groups. So they're, they're making a donation based on money that's been collected by, by a large group of people fundraising together and individuals who donate large sums. So it doesn't make sense to offer people who've donated um, large figures in the past, very low value donation point plot prompts. So their priorities were really decided on their very specific circumstances and a good knowledge of their audience. So let's look at some other smaller kind of tech wins and places to start. Um, first of all, are your contact permissions integrated? And that's something I, I noticed on the poll. A lot of people said we don't have integrated contact permissions. If you're collecting separate opt-ins for different lists or audiences, such as campaigns and fundraising, consider whether that's the right approach. If you're collecting consent from people in a way that means you can't offer them some of the ways to support you, both you and they could be missing out. A broader consent doesn't mean you're going to spam them with everything, but it means you can decide what's the most effective ask at a particular time rather than having to exclude certain offers or activities because you're not allowed to contact them. So if you're collecting a campaign contact consent that doesn't cover fundraising, you're missing out on the chance to offer people the, the, the opportunity to support you financially and vice versa. So here's just a couple of examples of um, the opt-ins that some of our clients use on forms. Work out a simple data flow that allows you to send a reminder email. This is one of the most basic forms of segmentation. Can you email people again who did not take the action first time? 
If you're not doing this yet, it's a great place to start. If it takes weeks for action data to make it into your CRM and onwards into your email tool, this may be quite challenging. So perhaps make friends with your data hit team to see if there's a short-term workaround or a one-off solution to allow you to send a kicker for particularly important calls to action. And this can really pay off. Our experience is a single reminder email that goes to people who received the email but didn't open or didn't, didn't respond to it can boost your action rates for up to 40%. Um, so it's very much worth doing. Improve the on-page journeys. So the warmest a supporter will ever be is when they've just taken an action for you. So for example, asking a donation for somebody for a don donation immediately after they have taken an action can be really effective. This will work best if you're using systems which work together. So for example, pre-filling form fields so that the supporter doesn't have to re-enter the data they've just given you so that the data flows work together. So here's an example. So the Refugee Council tried this out, prompting for a donation via an overlay, so like a pop-up over the thank you page of a campaign action. Um, and their uh, pilot, uh, their test of this, um, people converted, they converted 1.64% of um, the 63,000 people who took the action to donation. So here's how it works. So here's the action form. Um, you'll notice the, the phone number field, which explains underneath that leaving a phone number will be treated as consent to contact via phone. And on submit, the supporter is presented with this um, pop-up. If they proceed, the form is pre-filled pre with the data that they've already given. And if they close the pop-up, they're offered the chance to share the action. Here's how it looks on a mobile device. So since that initial test, um, this approach has considered, continued to be really successful for them with about 1.4% of people who take action donating on the thank you page for the first time across their 2021 campaigns. They also tested phone calling people who took an action and, and opted into phone contact. So remember that phone field and that's um, given a, an 11% conversion rate to a regular gift via direct debit. And they've since scaled up that activity after their initial tests and it's continued to be very successful. So obviously process and people is a really big part of this as our, um, our poll showed. Besides the tech, there's a ton of the stuff that you can do focused on how you do things. Get your colleagues interested in data. A lot of people glaze over when you start talking about data. GDPR has a lot to answer for, uh, but you need to get them excited as well as scared. I, I'm going back to that why that uh, Beth was, what Ruth was talking about earlier. Tell them stories about the cool stuff that good data management is going to help you do. Um, and if you're testing something new, share the results, lunch and learn, post it on the internet or your Slack channel. People find it much easier to engage with specifics. Integrate your planning. This might mean introducing new cross-organizational planning processes, shared calendars, Trello boards, building project groups. For example, at the Trussell Trust, their whole new structure has departments based on support stage and behavior rather than traditional structures of fundraising and campaigning. So there's a team for audience attraction and engagement and one for supporter retention and development. So this focus is switched to how people interact with them and where they are in the relationship. So this means the teams have to work more collaboratively with each other and also with their policy and strategic communications teams. Invest in training. Whether you're running in-house workshops or bringing in external trainers, bringing people together from different parts of the organization can be a really helpful first step to establish a common approach and understanding. And that can feed into discussions about those cross-organizational planning processes that you want to bring in. This is how we kick off most of our supporter journey projects when we work with clients. And the biggest one of all, run a pilot project. You're much more likely to get people on board to try something new if you reassure them that this is a pilot, you're not, you're not um, you know, revolutionizing everything out of the box. So if your organization isn't quite ready for a full restructure, um, this is a good place to start. For example, a welcome journey for a specific cohort or a particular time bound campaign. It's a great way to try out new ways of working. You're more likely to get permission to bypass or adapt normal processes, try something out, gather learning and evidence for your business case for investment and, and change of processes. For example, MenCap use Impact Stack for both campaigning and fundraising, but the limitations of their current CRM means they're reliant on slower manual data process uh, data transfers, and they don't have established organizational processes for that joint planning. 
So staff in the individual giving and campaigning teams have worked together on two pilot projects using campaigning actions as the start of an integrated supporter journey, including both donation and further campaign action asks. So treating each project as a standalone pilot with firm boundaries and a clear plan to make sure that all the supported data was being handled securely and responsibly and was going to end up in the right place, that allowed them to get permission to work temporarily in parallel with their usual data processes. So supported data could move straight from impact stack into their .mailer mailing tool so that the follow-ups ne and the next steps in the journey could be really timely and responsive and the CRM would be updated later just for this subset of data for this fixed period. So uh, Mencap found that people recruited via a campaigning action were more likely to open emails and take action than people recruited via other sources. This matches our more onion experience across a lot of projects. 7% of people who signed the initial petition for Activism Week went on to donate before the end of the email sequence, and they beat their recruitment target for a high bar in-person campaign activity. And here's a quick look at some of the actions on the email journey. So the success of these pilot projects has allowed them to build organisational interest and discussion about new working practices to support integrated planning and delivery. It's also collected some hard evidence of the benefits of more integration, which is feeding into thinking around their future CRM needs. So to close, takeaways. First of all, there is no there. <laughs> and I think this has already come up on change management. I call it integration entropy. People naturally drift into siloed groups. New ideas come up, they need to be given space to grow and play before you bring them back into the fold. New staff are going to come on board. And obviously we've, we've noted this morning, more, more changeover and more churn in the charity sector than in other sectors. You need to bring new staff on board with your approach. They're gonna need training and induction. There's never going to be a point where you can say, we're there now, we've done integration, we are now integrated. It's an ongoing project. Secondly, it's hard, sorry. Anyone who tells you that their database or their tool is going to make it easy <laughs> is being dishonest. Um, be very mistrustful of anyone who, who suggests that a particular model is going to, to answer all your questions. Even the best technical systems are going to need you to make the strategic decisions about what you want them to do and a constant effort to keep overcoming that entropy and to keep all different parts of your organization working well together. It's about people. Uh, data is not a resource managed by the data team. We're talking about your supporters, we're talking about people here. So dealing with data is basically treating someone respectfully. Start with what you need the data to do to support your relationships and work out what the data flows need to look like and how you might get there. Remember that supporters' expectations are shaped by their experiences of dealing with organisations who have a lot of data and use it well. It's about people, your organisation. You need to invest in getting your systems to work together and you need to invest in people, often to get them to change how they work. Getting your colleagues to buy into change can be tough. Think about the letting go stage that Ruth referred to in the presentation this morning and there are some great tips there. We hope the examples we've given in this presentation will help you bring people with you by showing them why and, and, and a bit of information about the how you can improve and, and change what you're doing. But crucially, remember what there is to play for better relationships, better supporter experiences, and crucially more impact for your cause. We're planning to release a report on this topic this next year with a bit more detail and additional case studies. So you can sign up to our mailing list. Um, my colleague Lucy is just gonna be popping a link into the chat to stay informed when it comes out. And obviously we would love to hear from you if you've got a great integration case study to share. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.